So thank you again for joining us for Soil Stories. Um, let me introduce today's guest, Jim Armendaris. He is the State Rangeland Management Specialist for the Federal Natural Resource Conservation Service, or NRCS, which is an acronym you will hear throughout um, today. Uh, but he works in New Mexico. It's a federal agency under the United States Department of Agriculture, but um, then they have state departments. And so Jim is part of the state department. Jim was born and raised in New Mexico in the Santa Rosa Fort Sumner area with his family works on uh, other ranches, but also they're growing their own grass fed herd under the company name A&G Family Meats. Jim has a degree in animal and range sciences from New Mexico State University. And he worked on and off for NRCS and the, also the Bureau of Land Management for the last 16 years as wildland, fi wildland firefighter and rangeland specialist. Um, to say that Jim is passionate about improving soil health through, through range management is really an understatement. I first learned about him through one of his amazing YouTube videos shot on the tailgate of his truck where he compares one side of the highway with the other. Um, and in doing so, he demonstrates very effectively how different ways of rangeland management lead to different results. We are very lucky to have such an approachable and dedicated advocate for soil health in office as N at NOCS. And I look forward to learning more about where that passion comes from as Jim will be sharing his soil story with us today. So thank you so much, Jim, for being here with us. Thanks a lot, Isabel, for having me over. Uh, it's really uh, an honor to be a speaker at, at this today. Uh, I'm a huge fan of your guys' work uh, at the Soil Healthy Soil Working Group. Um, I, I watch your videos all the time, uh, and I really, truly admire your guys' work. And so thanks for having me over. Um, I was talking to Isabel earlier before everybody got on, but uh, the Soil mm -hmm. Health Movement it's it's been around for a while, but it's slowly starting to take off on rangelands in New Mexico, and and in my opinion, we're a little bit behind uh, on soil health in New Mexico, uh, mostly because this soil health movement really just kind of took off on rangeland uh, on croplands. It was a cropland thing for a long time, and it's slowly starting to evolve to include rangelands, and uh, and I'll talk about that today in, in my presentation. Um, if I can get everything working. So can you guys see? Um, Perfect. Yeah. Okay. And so a little bit about myself. Um, let's see. So I, as Isabel said, I, I grew up ranching in the Santa Rosa, Fort Sumner, Vaughn, Cuervo, that, that kind of area in, in Eastern New Mexico. Um, I grew up on ranches that didn't belong to us. I grew up ranching. My dad was a ranch hand for a ranch out between Santa Rosa and, and Vaughn, New Mexico for a long time. And that's really where I grew up, a little town called Pastura out in the middle of nowhere. I was blessed to grow up this way. Um, it was uh, the only job where you can take your kids to work every day. And, and my parents did. They, they, they took us to work every day and, and and we went to college, we got degrees, but most of our schooling really came from just growing up doing it, you know? Um, and so I was able to get a degree in animal and range sciences from New Mexico State University. And, uh, you know, I, I talk to a lot of youth these days and, and you ask these kids these days, uh, what do you wanna do when you grow up? What do you wanna be? And a lot of people say, well, I'm not sure. I don't know. And, and be as old as 20 years old these days, and they're still not sure what they want to do. You know, but that, that was never the case for me. Uh, since I could remember, I knew that I wanted to be a rancher. Even though we didn't have a ranch of our own, I knew this is what I wanted to do. And so, um, so I went to an MSU, got a degree in range and animal science, and said, well, maybe that should be a good degree to be able to pursue this dream. Like, like every cowboy we all dream of a ranch of our own, you know? And so, and, and lucky for me, my dad had the same dream and my brother had the same dream and, and we've all had the same dream. And so uh, these days people tell you, if you don't have a ranch of your own, 
either the altar, the, the cradle or the grave is the only way to get a ranch. You know, you, you either marry into one or, or you inherit one from a dead guy or you, um, you're born into it. Well, we weren't, so we had to go a different route. Um, my dad's always been a mover and a shaker. He's always been a hustler and it's a good thing he didn't go to college because they would have taught him that it can't be done. He's the only one that doesn't know that it can't be done. And so we decided to build one of our, of our own. Um, started out with a 12 cow grazing lease outside of uh, San Rosa, New Mexico in 2002, I believe. Uh, fast forward 2022, uh, what is that? 20 years later, uh, we've been able to grow the herd to a 2000 cow herd. We've been able to uh, start a small grass finished beef company where we fill a small niche market here in New Mexico. Um, and so it's safe to say that I'm passionate about farming and ranching. Uh, I'm also blessed to have a really good job. I'm, I'm also the state rangeland management specialist for New Mexico, where not only do I get to improve my ranch, but I get to help people get to a better place on, on their grazing management and, and their health of their lands and, and so uh every time i go to somebody else's place i learn something from them and then i come back and bring it to to my place and i try to put it into practice and so a little bit about ranching in new mexico the, the ranch our ranch is run by my parents carlos and elia armendariz uh, and they run the place my brother and i my, my family and, and my brother's family we all hitch in whenever we can the ranch consists of about 1,800 deeded acres uh, in Cuervo, New Mexico, and about 9,000 acres of grazing leases scattered all over uh, three counties. Um, when you start from the bottom up and you don't have a ranch, you take a lease wherever you can find it. So we've got leases in Debaca County, Guadalupe County, and in uh, Roosevelt County. Some of them are in Cuervo, some of them are in Puerto de Luna, New Mexico, uh, others over all, all the way in Tolar, New Mexico, um, outside of Fort Sumner. Wherever we can find them, we've taken them and we've done what we can to make them all better. Uh, we joke in our family, we call it scattered land and cattle because it's scattered all, all over three counties. Um, we've also got a ranch in Old Mexico, um, about 80 miles south of the Big Bend. If any of you have been to Big Bend National Park, it's about 80 miles south as the crow flies. Both ranches are very different. We manage them very differently, uh, mostly for logistical reasons. Uh, the one in New Mexico gets a lot of attention because all of us are there giving it effort. And we give a lot of effort on the one in Mexico, except uh, it's, it's, a, it's far away. It's 200 miles from the border and a hundred of those miles is dirt road. And so that one, we've got to manage it very differently. But we're always working on that one too, trying to get it to a better place. You can see from one of these pictures, um, standing in some pretty tall grass. The gla it's Chihuahua desert country, but it's also very productive when it does rain. But we've done everything from grazing management to prescribed burning. You can see on the bottom left corner, my dad and myself uh, and my wife did a prescribed burn there in 2000, I think it was 2011. And so we're always trying something different. Uh, trying to get the lands to a better place. And so as Isabel said, I've worked for the NRCS and the BLM for about 15 years now. I've jumped back and forth between both agencies and, and, and it, they're both great agencies to work for. Uh, I've learned a lot along the way working for both of them. Everything from uh, grazing management to fire management, prescribed burning, uh, it's been really good. And so, we're here to talk about the soil health movement. So as I said earlier, this soil health movement really just kind of started out on, on croplands and it's slowly evolving and it's, it's becoming a rangeland thing. Um, when I first started in this particular job, I was tasked with, uh, well, let, let me rewind. So, so part of the reason, like I said, most of New Mexico is rangelands. There's very little cropland in New Mexico, uh, less than 20%. 80% rangeland, the rest of it is either cities, towns, other lands, or, or cropland. And so because this soil health movement really started on croplands, uh, I'm convinced that that's why we're, we've been slow to adopt it in New Mexico. But 
but it's starting to take off. Um, and so the beauty of the soil health movement is that for, for all of my federal career, I've had to go and do assessments on lands. And uh, usually we use the 17 indicators of rangeland health. Um, we use it at BLM, we use it at NRCS. I did those assessments till I was blue in the face. And I'd look at them and, and they were so long and so complicated. I could never do them with a rancher and keep them tuned in the whole time. Um, they're really overly technical in my opinion. Um, if you try to do them with a rancher within the first 20 minutes, you usually lose the person. That's what I like about the soil health movement, that it's a very simple. And for years and years, I said to myself, we need something that's simple and adoptable by any rancher. And so in my opinion, if you, if you go and do an assessment on the health of a, range, a piece of rangeland with a rancher who spends more time on the land than anybody, than even the scholars, and you lose them, then, then it's broken, okay? And so if you can't keep the person that spends the most time out of anybody in the world on the rangelands tuned in to your, through your entire assessment, there's something wrong with it. And so that's the beauty of this soil health movement, that it's such a simple deal. It, it's five principles, five principles of soil health. We'll go through all five of them. The beauty of it, you, you can apply these five principles of soil health to your farmland you can apply them to your garden, your, your backyard garden. For those of you who are gardeners, you can apply them to rangeland. Um, and so when I first started this job, I was tasked with making the soil health movement a rangeland thing. And, and I racked my brain for a couple months. It was the first item I had to do. And my boss told me, he said, you, you got to make this thing a rangeland thing. I said, well, how in the world am I going to do that? And I thought about it, thought about it. And it finally dawned on me that the five soil health principles applied to rangeland exactly the same as they did to croplands and, and, and backyard gardens. Uh, it dawned on me that the rangeland folks have had it right from the start. We just didn't know it. We would have been calling it rangeland health, but in the end, it's really soil health. If the soils aren't healthy, then the rangelands aren't healthy. And so we'll go over the five principles of soil health for those of you who aren't familiar with them. Um, the first principle of soil health is maximizing a continuous living root. One of the most important principles. The second one, minimizing disturbance. The third one is maximizing biodiversity. The fourth one is maximizing soil cover. And, and the fifth one, uh, some people talk about it, some people don't. Uh, integrating livestock. Uh, integrating livestock kind of um, speeds up the process of, of the land's healing. You also got to be very careful with the livestock portion because that's kind of how we got in this mess on rangeland. So, so you can't overdo it, also known as overgrazing. Um, so I'll go through each one of these principles and how they apply to, to rangelands. Uh, the first one, I don't know if you guys have a lag time when I present. Uh, usually there's a little bit of lag, but hopefully there isn't. The first one, maximizing a continuous living root. Why is it so important? Uh, this is one of the most important principles because as ranchers, we've been worried about feeding our cattle, feeding our livestock, sheep, goats, pigs, cows. And we completely forgot about feeding the soil microbes that feed the plant and the plant feeds the cow. And so this is what this principle is about. It's about feeding the microorganisms that live within the soil. We're talking earthworms, we're talking nematodes, we're microscopic organisms, millions of them that live in the soil, even on rangeland. Millions of microbes live in these soils that we've completely forgot about. If we take care of the microorganisms within the soil, the microorganisms take care of the plant and the plant takes care of the cattle and the cattle takes care of the rancher. And so it's all a big connected system. And so that those living groups, they help cycle nutrients, they help cycle carbon and water. Uh, there's no better thing in the world to break up compaction than a living root in your soil. Um, as farmers, we tried plows, we tried uh, chisels, we tried everything. Nothing does it better than, than Mother Nature. Um, when God made the world, he knew what he was doing. Uh, we thought we could do better, and we keep finding out that we're wrong. Um, the living roots build up soil structure, uh, and it's the combination of the living roots and all the microbes within there feeding on these living groups that build soil structure. Those living groups roots reduce wind and water erosion. And so 
for years and years, I say, you know, the range folks had it right from the start. Um, for years and years, we've been doing studies and, and we keep coming to the same conclusion that uh, having grazing without recovery periods uh, result in, uh, in unhealthy plants, which result in un unhealthy rangelands. And so if you take care of the land, the land will take care of you. And uh, the next soil health principle is maximizing biodiversity. Um, you can see in this slide, um, we've got all, these are some of the most common grasses you should see on rangelands. Uh, the bottom left corner, this one here, that's blue grama. Everybody should know that grass. That is uh, the state grass for New Mexico. Uh, the one next to it is side oats grama, okay? Another very productive uh, grass. This one right here, sc scarlet globe mallow, uh, annual forb, uh, excellent forage for wildlife. The one over here on the left is either galleta or tobosa grass. I forget which one, they both look almost identical. Uh, your tobosa grows in Southern New Mexico, your galleta grows uh, Northern New Mexico. They look almost identical, but they do grow a little bit different. Uh, you really have to key it out to know which one's which. This one over here in the top right corner, this is a uh, needle and thread. Uh, it's a cool season grass. The one next to it right here, Indian rice grass, also a cool season grass. And the one next to it there is uh, Western wheatgrass. And the one up in the top left corner, Indian paintbrush, um, another uh, annual forb in New Mexico. And so it's important that you have a lot of different species of grasses and plants on your rangeland because all of them are gonna green up at different times of the year. That means green forage for your livestock at most of the year. Um, the cool season grasses are also missing on most New Mexico rangelands. Uh, they, they were rare to begin with. Then on top of that, it's the first thing that greens up. Well, these cattle have been eating dry roughage all, all winter long. They've been eating hay. They're hungry for something green. As soon as you turn them out, this stuff's greening up and, and they get after it pretty quick. And so for that reason, we've mostly grazed out our cool season grasses on most New Mexico rangelands. Um, let me see if this thing's working. And so when you maximize biodiversity above ground, you're also maximizing biodiversity below ground. We never think about the stuff that goes on below ground, but like I said, when you've got different kinds of species, then you've got more food for different kinds of microorganisms that live within the soil that are eating, that are living down there, that are, this is their habitat. Um, and like I said, you want a mix of as many grasses, uh, warm season grasses, cool season grasses, annual grasses, annual forbs, perennial forbs, all of it. All of them are, are part, of, part of the system. Uh, some of them are missing. Some of them, we have a lot of the, usually the undesirable species. Um, the stuff with thorns on it, the unpalatable stuff, that's the stuff that we end up getting a lot of when we don't manage the, ran, the lands right. And so the more diversity you have, the more living roots you'll have in the soil and you'll have a green forage for a longer period of time. Um, when you lose a species such as a cool season grass or only have, say a single species cover crop on your, on your croplands, it takes longer to get a live root in the ground in the springtime. Uh, it also takes longer to get green forage above the surface and all of that affects the microbiology going on within the soil. And so, so in, in the ranching world, we're, we're trying to raise beef, we're trying to raise cattle. Um, we're trying to get one calf per cow every year, which is a very hard thing to do. Uh, just to put it in perspective, the, there's 365 days in a year. Okay? The gestation of a Angus cow is 285 days. Okay? So from the day that cow gets pregnant to the day she has that calf, 285 days more or less. Okay? So take 265, 365 days in a year and subtract 285 days, the gestation of, a, of an Angus cow. That leaves you 80 days left in the year. You got 80 days left to get that cow. She's nursing a calf. She's healing her reproductive tract because she just had a hundred pound calf. And we expect her to breed back within 80 days. That's a lot to ask from an animal, right? But we, we do it. We do it all the time. 
it's very hard to do. And so to put it in perspective for at least 30 days, if that cow calved in good body condition score, as, as we say in, in, in the ranching world, for at least 30 days, she's not even thinking about breeding or even finding a bull and letting him breed, right? And so subtract 30 days from the 80 you have, that leaves you 50 days, okay? The estrus cycle of a beef cow, 21 days. So you divide 50 by 21, that gives you two chances, two chances for that bull to find that cow in heat, conceive, and give you another calf next year as a rancher. Very hard thing to do. It's even harder when you're missing that cool season component because if you're lucky, you have green grass by May, but the growing season started in, in March, you know? As soon as you get the cool season grasses back on your lands, your chances of success in the ranching world increase quite a bit. And so I tell ranchers all the time, if you only set the goal of increasing the cool season grasses on your ranch, you would solve about 10 other problems without even trying, just by getting the cool season grasses back. And so uh, very important. Uh, I always emphasize the cool season grasses uh, to anybody who will listen. The next soil health principle, maximizing cover, you can see this is a fence line contrast. You see this all the time, all over the West. You see one person's doing really good with their management, the other one's not. Uh, the benefits of maximizing cover uh, protects the soil from wind and water erosion, okay? We don't have a whole lot of what we call topsoil in New Mexico because we're in an arid state, right? And so if our quote unquote topsoil blows away, it's even harder to make a living off these lands, okay? The other really important part that it moderates the fluctuations in, in soil temperature, which in turn reduces evaporation. And uh, uh, put this in perspective, I got a brother who went to Iraq two times uh, in the military. And he told me that it was 130 degrees over there. He also told me that he had never been so cold in his life than in that barren desert, okay? This is what happens when you don't have cover on the land, right? The temperatures fluctuate quite a bit. And it wasn't that it was the coldest place he'd ever been, it's that the temperature changed so much from daytime 130 degrees down to 60 degrees. That's almost 90 degrees change in temperature, right? Okay, the same thing happens on these soils when you're a microorganism trying to make a life within these soils, in the daytime, when, when you're on bare ground, 110 degrees out here like it gets, and then at night it gets down to 60, pretty hard to live in these soils, right? Pretty hard to function. And so that's, what, that's where the cover comes in. It, it makes insulation on the ground. And the nights are not as cold and the days are not as hot for all those microbes living in the soil. We never think about the microbes, right? We just think about soil blowing. We think about... Um, forage for livestock. We think about these things. We've completely forgotten about everything that, that happens underneath the soil surface. Uh, even in college, when we went to school, they didn't teach us these things. The soil health movement, it's really kind of grown in the last few years. They taught us about everything that was dead in the soil. They taught us about bulk density, minerals. They taught us about, they, they hardly even mentioned all, well, the most important part, all, all the life that happens within these soils. And so, as I said, it protects us from erosion. It increases infiltration. That's a huge one. We can get all the rain in the world, but if it never gets in the soils, then it's good for nothing. Um, I've got some YouTube videos. If you Google soil health on rangelands uh, or, or on YouTube, you'll see some of my videos that talk exactly to that. Uh, we're getting rain on our New Mexico rangelands, and at least 50% of it runs off, ends up in a gully in the Arroyo eventually in the river, and maybe some of it ends up in Texas, okay? These are our rains on our lands. Um, and so to put it in perspective, ranchers always talk about how much rain they got. Everybody's always comparing, well, I got 10 inches, and oh, how about you? Oh, I got 12 inches this year, okay? If, you're, if your lands are healthy, on a healthy piece of rangeland, you can harvest up to 80% of, of the rain that lands on there, 75%. But if your lands are unhealthy and you got 12 inches of rain on your place, 50% of it ran off and only 50% got in the soil, it's like you only got six inches of rain, right? Meanwhile, your neighbor, he got 10 inches of rain, 75% of that got into his soils. 
who got more rain, you know? And so at the end of the day, bare ground is the enemy here. Uh, if a third of your ranch is bare ground, it's like your ranch is a third smaller, you know? It's really expensive to buy ranch land in New Mexico. The cheapest way is to get your land soil, your soil healthy and your lands healthy. Because if you double the production on your land, it's kind of like you double the size of your ranch. Um, and so the, the last one is uh, minimizing disturbance. Uh, minimizing disturbance in the cropland world where this soil health movement started, it really referred to tillage. It referred to using uh, inputs, herbicides, pesticides, things like that, chemical inputs. In the rangeland worlds, we don't use a lot of herbicides or chemicals chemical inputs, uh, we don't till the land. What we're referring to in the rangeland world when we talk about minimizing disturbance, we're talking about minimizing disturbance after a grazing event, which really means maximizing the amount of rest that a pasture gets after you've grazed it, okay? This is nothing new in the rangeland world. We've been preaching this for a long time. Now we're, we're calling it soil health and, and we're running with it. Um, and so, we can go over three different management systems. We've got continuous grazing. We've got a simple rotational grazing, and then we have an intensive grazing down here on the bottom left. Um, and you can see all of them have their pros and cons. Um, this crazy management stuff, uh, I tell people this crazy management stuff is a lot like Christianity. You know, the Catholics and the Methodists and the Baptists and the Jehovah's Witnesses can't agree on the little things. But at the end of the day, we, we can all agree that we want to be good and we want to go to heaven and uh, we want to be good to our neighbor, right? The well, same goes for this crazy management. The continuous grazers and the rotational and the intense grazers, they can't agree on who's right and who's wrong. But at the end of the day, we're all trying to do the best that we could do with what we got, okay? Um, an example here on the bottom, this gives a pretty good picture of, of what it's like, you know, on the bottom gives you a visual 12 months continuous grazing. Uh, if you switch it up into four paddocks, you can give the land about three months of grazing and, and uh, nine months of rest throughout the year, you know, assuming that everything's the same, right? When you take it a step further and you cross fence those four paddocks and make uh, 16 paddocks, then you really start to see a lot of progress in, in getting those uh, Cool season grasses, getting diversity back on your land, getting more cover. Uh, still running the same amount of livestock, but you're giving the land more rest. So, so in that particular example, you can get three and a quarter weeks of grazing within a paddock in a year and give it almost 11, a little over 11 months of rest per year. You really start to see a lot of results when, when you start to break your place up into smaller paddocks. Uh, it's not easy to do, it's expensive, it's time consuming, all of it has its pros and cons. Um, we've started to do that on our ranch in New Mexico, but the one in Mexico, not so much. Uh, why? Because it, it costs a lot of money uh, and you've, it requires a lot more management. Like it says in, in, the, in the pros and cons, it requires a lot more attention, keeping up with fences and, and things like that. Uh, waters, all these kind of things. And we're getting better at it slowly with uh, electric fencing. Uh, we've got a new thing called uh, virtual fencing. That's a brand new thing. Um, you can uh, Google virtual fencing um, if you get a chance. I won't get into virtual fencing right now. Um, but for, for all of this to work, you have to know how much forage your place has the potential to produce. Uh, and, and this varies from year to year, depending on rainfall, right? But, uh, but you can get an idea of, of what the land has the capacity to do. And so when you start talking about management systems, it won't matter which system you use if your forage is not in balance with the amount of livestock on there. So the first step is knowing what you got, how, what, what kind of lands do I got? What kind of ecological sites are on my land and how much forage can each of those sites produce? And I'll get into ecological site descriptions here. Ecological site descriptions is one of the handiest tools that I use in my job. Uh, it's, it's a document that tells you more or less what historically grew on the land. You can see this 
table here on the left, uh, this is an equal site description for a sandy loam. Okay, it has the potential to, to have a blue grama, galleta, black grama, buffalo grass, sand drop seed, writes three on side oats, grama, vine mesquite, silver beard grass, western wheat, and plains bristle grass. Okay, so that tells me that these lands historically had the potential to produce 10 different grasses, two of them, three of them, which are cool season grasses, and the rest of them, warm season grasses. You go out onto your rangeland and you can only count four or five grasses, but the place has potential to produce 10. Then you have to ask yourself the question, am I maximizing biodiversity? And that's the beauty of this simple assessment that you can just ask yourself, well, and if, if the place has potential to have 10 different grasses and you've only got four, then the answer is no, right? There's room for improvement. Very simple. You don't have to have a PhD to figure that one out. Um, you can see on the other table on, on your bottom left corner, it tells you more or less how much annual production to expect off of each, each ecological site. Um, you can see over here, and it breaks it down to grass-like, forbs, bio-crust, shrubs, and vines. In this particular eco site, a sandy loam, on a low year, it'll do 350 pounds per acre. On an average year, 575 pounds per acre, and on a really good year, about 800 pounds per acre. And so we try to plan for, a, for an average year or less. Uh, if we plan for a high year, we know in New Mexico, we don't get high years every year. But if we plan for somewhere in the middle, we'll uh, get a lot further. Here's an example of, of what I do. Um, when somebody asks me for help, I, I take their place and I map it all out and I do it like this. This is, this is an example of a thousand acre pasture. So let's imagine this square is a thousand acres and there's three different eco sites on it. And we come to the conclusion, we've got all these handy tools where I work. We've got ArcGIS, one of the handiest tools that I use. I can make that program tell me how many acres of every eco site there is in every pasture on somebody's ranch. For example, if this, if it tells me, okay, you got 300 acres out of those thousand acres of, of loamy site, you got 200 acres of the 1000 are clay and the rest, the other 500 are gravelly. I can figure out about how many pounds per acre of annual production, total production, only on the grass like I, I only use the grass like. I don't really count on the forbs because they're not reliable, but the grass like, if I know that the loamy produces about 700 pounds per acre on an average year and the gravelly does about 500, 450 pounds per acre on an average year and the clay does about 580 pounds per acre, this is nothing but a simple math problem. It's a little bit of science, a little bit of math. This uh, grazing management stuff, it's, it's not really rocket science. It's, it's really just a big math problem. So I start cranking out some math, okay? Uh, if I come to the conclusion that the loamy produces about 210,000 pounds of annual production and 116,000 pounds of clay on the clay and 220 pounds on the gravelly, then I can expect about 551,000 pounds of annual production on that pasture, right? Okay, so the general rule of thumb is we don't want to take it all. We want to take half and leave half. Uh, the uh, half we take it with our livestock, the other half we want to leave on the ground for all the benefits of soil health, for that cover, for uh, infiltration, all, all those good things, uh, wildlife, things like that. So we cut that number in half, it gives us 275,500 pounds of usable forage. This is what we can take off the land with our cows. Divided by 900, which is one AUM, one animal unit month, which is the amount of forage that one mature cow will eat in a month, okay? It's also about the size of one round bell, 900 pounds that you see on a field. One of those big round bounds, about 900 pounds, okay? One of those round bells will feed one cow for one month, more or less. So the question we're really asking ourselves is, if I had the ability to cut and bale this, this pasture and leave half of the forage on there, how many of these round bells weigh 900 pounds could I get? And then I can figure out how many head of cattle I can feed, okay? Uh, that's as simple as I can put it for folks who don't really speak AUMs. Uh, so once you figure out that this whole thing can do 306 AUMs, you, you can start solving a lot of problems. So how many cows can I run in this pasture if I want it to be a continuous grazer? 306 AUMs divided by 12 months, 26 cows, okay? Even for a rancher who doesn't have the ability to cross fence his place, if they did nothing more than just balance the annual production 
with the ability, if they did nothing more than balance the livestock with the ability of the land to produce forage, they would start to see results within a year, okay? And everybody's in a different place, right? Not all ranchers can move cattle every day. Not all ranchers can cross fence their place. But if you can do nothing more than just get the land in balance with the cattle, you'll start to see results. Mm -hmm. um, Jim, let me just uh, say that we passed six o'clock, but we're all listening very intently. So if we could slowly come to an end, we'd appreciate okay. it. Thank yeah, you. I tell you, I could, I could talk about this all day. Um, let me get to these next pictures, okay? This is on our own place. Uh, this is uh, my dad's ranch. Uh, we've been able to make this kind of progress within two years. The, the picture on the left was taken in uh, 2020, picture on the right in, in 2022, okay? It took a long time to make this progress, but the progress, it didn't take that long to see the progress. The hardest part about this whole deal is trying to talk an old rancher who's been doing it this way for, for generations into trying something new. It only took less than two years to see these results. It took about 10 years to try to talk somebody into trying something different. The hardest part is, is taking the first step. Uh, here's, here's a few more pictures. You can see on the left, a lot of bare ground on the right. We've got a lot of cover. Less than two years it took to get there. Um, knowing what I know now, I know that if I get 10 inches of rain on this picture on the right, I can get most of that into my soils. If I got the same 10, 10 inches on the land when it used to be uh, like the picture on the left, at least half of those 10 inches were running off and ending up in the gully. And so as you start to get better at it, uh, it takes less rain to make grass. Um, and as you get worse at it, it, it takes more rain to, to, to get the, uh, the lands producing again. And so most people are still convinced that their lands look the way they look and are in a degraded state because it hasn't rained. I used to think that too. I've learned a lot since then. Uh, it's really easy to point the finger at the weather, but getting rain is only half the battle. The other half of the battle is how much rain are we harvesting into our soils every time that it does rain. Um, here's another picture, same, same deal. And uh, that's all I've got for you guys today. Uh, I appreciate your time and I'll take questions if you guys have them. Awesome. Thank you, Jim. Thank you so much. That was really great. Um, if you stop sharing your screen, then we can see each other again. That would be great. And there has been some really good discussions in the chat, meanwhile. Um, I'm gonna just recognize a couple of people. If you'd like to uh, unmute yourself, uh, please go ahead. If you'd like to put your video on, you can do that too. Um, Jeremy, you had a bunch of questions and comments. Maybe just pick one for, for beginning purposes and um, everyone else who would like to chime in, please just um, put your question in the chat and I will ask you to unmute. So Jeremy, go ahead. Hi, oh, yeah, so... Give me a second. Let me look back at the chat because I did have a few questions. <laughs> I know. I one of one of my biggest questions was what breeds of cattle are you run are you raising on the different ranches and are you raising different breeds of cattle based on the different conditions of the different ranches? Uh, yes, sir. So so mostly we we're running Angus cattle. Uh, not because I think an Angus cow is the best cow in the world but because the Angus Association convinced the world that it was the best cow. And so that's what the people want on their table. They want Angus beef, right? Mm -hmm. And so Angus Association was able to do what Nike did with tennis shoes, okay? And so they've kind of pushed everybody into growing a black cow. Uh, we do have another, we have a place in Puerto Luna. It's very dry, it's very rocky. Mm -hmm. we, we do run some Corriente cattle in, in that place because they do a lot better on, on that type of land. Uh, that's and, all uh, is the, the Corriente cattle, that's just, uh, is that just like roping cattle usually basically, or what, what, what kind of, what is? What, they, the, everything ends up being beef at the end of the day. Uh, okay. But, and, and so we throw an Angus bull on them and we get half Corrientes and, and half Angus. And, uh, nah. and that improves the quality quite a bit. 
but uh, okay. we have to run Corrientes in that place because it is a lot drier and a lot hotter and, and harder to run a cow on there. Okay, okay. That was my question. It was was what you were running on on the ranches and what you know whether it was different breeds based on on the soil conditions or the conditions of the ranches. So, thank you. That was that was great. Yes, sir. Thank you. That's great. Yeah, Jeremy, we can return to you if we have time. You had a couple more comments there, but I um, I was going to uh, tell Jason to unmute himself if he would like to ask his question. Hello. So I guess um, what I was putting in the comments was less of a question and just more of comments to kind of augment what Jim Armandaris was saying. He put out some great information in there and um, I think some of what I said, I got there a little bit before he mentioned it in his um, presentation, but he did a great job of addressing the infiltration and how uh, having cover on the ground really helps get that, keep that rain on the ground. And, you know, personally, I'd love to see our ranchers here be able to use the rain that we get instead of sending it off to Texas. Thanks a lot, Jason. Great. I think we can all agree on that. Um, Joy, you have a question in the chat as well. Do you want to ask your question? Hi, um, I I have um, I'm losing my voice, but um, I was here with the fires in northeastern New Mexico, and there's a lot of people who have um, they wanting to regenerate their garden soil and also the ranch land. Do you have an idea on how to do that? after the fires? Yes, ma'am, it's, it's funny you should ask. Uh, I've, been, I've been in Las Vegas, New Mexico for the last 30 days uh, working on these fires to address exactly this issue. Um, we've, we've got a program called the Emergency Watershed Protection Program uh, through NRCS where I work. Uh, we're working on doing a lot of stuff. Uh, we're, right now we're working on aerial seeding, uh, most of that heavily burnt area. It's going to be really hard to burn all of, um, I'm sorry, not burn all the uh, aerial seed, all of it because it's 340,000 acres. It's a huge fire. But the places that burned really hot are, are the ones that we're focusing on aerial seeding. Uh, we're, we're shooting for an annual crop, an, an annual winter crop. The majority of the mix will be uh, an annual uh, winter wheat, uh, winter rye, something like that, something that'll establish a root pretty quick. Uh, you'd be surprised no matter how hard it burns, quite a, there's still quite a bit of seed alive in those soils. And, and we have to remember that, that these lands evolved with fire. Before there was human beings to put them out, they burned until it rained on them or until they got to the river, you know. Um, and so a lot of those lands are going to be all right. It's just going to take a little bit of time for them to heal. Uh, you're, you're also seeing a lot of runoff. I'm sure you've seen probably on... Uh, on the internet, a lot of that soil's coming off. Uh, it, that's really rich soil. For those of you who are gardeners, it's uh, full of uh, biochar. It's full of nutrients. Um, you can get see your hands on some of that soil that's in the arroyos right now in that part of the world. Good stuff. That's all I've got. Hopefully that answers your question. Yes, thank you so much. Yeah, and thank you for your hard work, Jim, in the in the fire area. Really appreciating that. Um, Susan has a question. Susan, please go ahead. This was a great presentation, Jim. Thank you very much. I've been wanting to learn more about what's really going on here in New Mexico and if these things work here. So it's great to hear that they do, and you're helping them work. My question is. Uh, where can we get a consult if I only have two acres, I'm working with neighbors who have 30 acres and trying to engage other neighbors, but it's not ranching, being ranched, it's really kind of more suburban homes or rural homes outside of Albuquerque. But there are old bean fields, so we're in the mountains, there are old bean fields, there are a lot of areas of cleared land. Um, and are, is there an agency that would consult with people like us and help us do that ecology and figure out how to get going on regenerating the land? Yes, ma'am. Uh, at, at NRCS, uh, that, that's, that's part of our job is to uh, provide technical assistance to any landowner who comes and asks for it. Uh, 
regardless of the size of your place, regardless of uh, how if you run livestock or if you don't, or, or if it's cropland, rangeland, um, that's that's part of our job. Uh, in my opinion, it's the most important part of our job. Um, so stop by your local NRCS office. The one that would service you would likely be uh, right downtown. Uh, well, no, not downtown Albuquerque. In, in Albuquerque, right off of Paseo, right next right, yeah. to the building that looks like a pyramid, uh, the, okay. the motel. Okay, the, the, I call it the glass house because the whole building is made of glass. And so stop at the glass house and, and visit your NRCS office and they should great. be able to help you out. Thank you, Jim. That's great. Thank you. Uh, Pam, please go ahead, ask your question. Uh, Jim, in the beginning of your presentation, you had mentioned um, that a lot of the of, of what you're presenting on was origin, originally for cropland. And my question is, what steps is the NRCS taking to differentiate between cropland and rangeland for uh, land managers? Okay, uh, and so the first thing we do, uh, when you're a producer that's got either cropland or rangeland, you take your uh, deeds and you take them to the farm service agency, which is our sister agency, and and they'll designate them either cropland or rangeland based on the the, the primary use. Um, and so we've got certain practices that we can apply only to croplands, and we've got other practices that apply to rangelands. Um, as far as the soil health movement is. Uh, when we talk about maximizing biodiversity, for example, on a cropland with a farmer, it's, in my opinion, it's a lot easier to do on farmland. You can take a multi-species cover crop, 15 species, no till it right into the land, irrigate it, and guess what? You got biodiversity on the land. Very different on rangelands. You've got to manage your way back to it. You, you can't just take a seed drill and say, oh, I'm gonna, I'm gonna drill some uh, Western wheat into the land. It's not that easy, too much acres, right? As you know, we, we, we've tried it and then it's, it's not that easy. And so the grazing, that's why the grazing management is so important. You, you have to manage your way back to productivity and back to diversity in the rangeland world, where in the cropland world, you can take a drill and drill diversity right back into the land. I hope that that helps. Did that answer your question, Pam? Or do, do you want to follow up or? You no, know, uh, it answered my question to a, a, to a point and what I can do is probably just get together with Jim later and ask some more specific questions. Um, I think he's pretty familiar um, from working with BLM, some of the questions that, um, that, or the confusion between wanting to apply practices to crop or to rangeland the same as you would a cropland and, and it is very different. So. Um, those are some of the struggles and, and some of the terminology that can't be applied um, to both. So, yeah, thank you. Thanks yeah. a lot, Pam. That's great. Thank you. Um, there's another question here from Russ. Please go ahead, Russ. Yes, Jim, thank you for the presentation. Uh, I'm just wondering if the state or the federal government uh, as long as, as far as the uh, the fire north of New Mexico, north of Las Vegas, New Mexico, uh, if they're putting in any water retention measures to help with the erosion and uh, you know to, to start uh, restoring the land. Yes, sir. Um, we've got a whole slew of practices that we're putting on the land. We're, we're while we're planning to put them on the land, um, we're we're getting to it as fast as we can get. Um, and not so much water retention, but erosion retention. Um, it's gonna be impossible to hold back the water that's gonna come down off of, off of these watersheds, but it is possible to hold back some of that sediment. And so we've got all kinds of practices. Uh, one of the most common one is trash racks. If you get a chance, uh, Google trash racks, Google image them. Uh, and it's a forestry practice. We, we lay a log across a gully and then we put, take smaller logs and build a ramp on the uphill side uh, that catches the sediment and catches all the debris, but allows the water to, 
filter through and hopefully we can avoid a bigger disaster uh, downstream. Yeah. Um, we got things like uh, sediment control basins uh, that we're putting on the land, wherever the land lends itself to do that. And the biggest one that's gonna make a difference is uh, this aerial seeding that we're working on doing. Okay. Now, when, when they do that, I hope they start at the top of the watershed. Because, uh, you know, if you, if you if you don't get enough slow down at the top, you're just going to wash out what's going on the bottom. So you say they are they are starting at the top of the watersheds. Yes, sir. That's that's where we try to start and, and work our way down. When we do our assessments, we climb the mountain, we look at the top and say what's going to come down from the top and what's going to end up on the bottom. And we've done a lot of hiking in the last 30 days. Uh, <laughs> getting fit. Great. Um, now, is, is Phoebe Sweena helping uh, with these efforts? I'm sorry, repeat Phoebe, that. One. Phoebe Sweena, she's a coach of tea. She has a she's a hydrologist. Uh, she gave a lecture here about uh, a month ago, actually. She may be. Um, I I don't know her. Um, she may be working directly with the fire. So we got two two different operations going on. We got the people handling handling the fire. Uh, and the stuff on forest service lands. And then we've got the people handling the stuff on private lands. Uh, and NRCS is handling um, a lot of the stuff on private lands. And so it could be that she's involved uh, and I just don't know about her. Okay, oh, thank you. Yes, sir, thank you. Thanks. Well, there's a lot of appreciation in the chat as well. Just people who say, thank you, Jim. and. Um, I, I, cannot, uh, I, I cannot disagree. <laughs> I really want to thank you very, very much. Do you have um, a closing uh, statement? Any words you want to share to um, finish up? Um, I, I really appreciate your guys' time and, and, uh, and it's really nice to see all this interest. Um, we've come a long way in the, in the, I'll speak from the ranchers, point of view um in the ranching world we got a lot we got a bad rap for a long time and a lot of it we we inflicted on ourselves uh we were really hard on the land and, and still are at times but we've also come a long way since those days um we're getting better at, at it all the time and uh there was a time when we didn't really when most of the West got overgrazed, when it, when it got beat up, it, it was usually times of war. When uh, World War I, World War II, the government had subsidies out to incentives to produce as much sheep as, as a rancher could produce. In those days, we didn't care about uh, the environment. That was not priority. We cared about winning wars and things like that, right? And so there was a time when all of New Mexico was, was sheep country, right? Because it provided fiber for uniforms we, the whole world was at war and it provided food uh, for soldiers and, and an entire world. That's, that's kind of was the beginning of, of this mess. This happened every time that the U.S. has gone to war. Um, and so, like I said, we, we, we've come a long way since those days too. And so uh, whether you're gardening or you're ranching or farming, uh, apply the soil health principles. They, they work. They're simple and they're adoptable for anybody. I appreciate you guys' time. Thank you, Jim. Awesome, yeah. Lots of um, thumbs up and clapping hands here on the Zoom screen. Thank you so much, thank you. Um, Thanks a lot and uh, you can find me, uh, my information on the internet if you had more questions down the road, I'm available. Great, yes. Definitely. One last question. Uh, oh, sure. Go ahead. Okay, uh, Jim. In your opinion, uh, how well is the uh, state and the the other agencies doing as far as putting enough resources into it? I mean, it's a huge, huge job. Just three hundred forty thousand acres for the uh, Hermit's Peak uh, Calf Canyon fire. That's a lot of land to restore, and I I would. I would be very happily surprised if they're putting as much uh, effort into this as they should. Uh, but there's, there is a, a big uh, 
problem with how much can they because it's such a huge problem. So you can't ask for miracles, but just just how, how do you feel as far as how much effort's being put into it and you think it's enough? Well, everybody's doing what they can. Um, the thing to remember is that these lands evolved with fire and they were made to heal on their own. And most mm -hmm. of the restoration is happening already and it's happening on its own. And so it, most people don't want to hear that right now, especially if they home burned down. That's a hard pill to swallow for somebody to come along and say, well, you know, the land's going to be better. It's going to be healthier. It's going to be good. Good. This good things are going to come of this. A lot of folks are not ready to hear that. Right. And I don't blame them. Yeah. But the fact remains that most of those lands are going to heal on their own. The lands were very unhealthy. Um, before we took a chainsaw to the land, but mother nature thinned the forest with fire. And so uh, when it's all said and done, in a few years, a lot of those 340,000 acres are going to be a lot healthier than they were before this fire. And so people ask me, how do I restore this, my forest? And in my mind, what I think, here's what I hear. I hear people asking, how do I restore the restoration? You know, the restoration is already happening. Mother Nature used fire to restore the land. And so hopefully that'll put your mind at ease for a bit. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Jim. Uh, taking the long view, and I remember that was a little bit what Phoebe shared with us uh, last month as well. And it, it, it's a hard thing um, to do, as you see the the destruction, and you know, for for people who are in in the fire zone, that that is very difficult. But um, I think it's it's good advice. So thank you so much. Um, yeah, with that we are at time. I just wanted to. Um, share that the next soil stories are going to be uh, a couple of authors. So we have um, actually Bill DeBuys uh, in August, on August 2nd. It's one of my favorite authors, so I'm really stoked to, um, he wanted to be interviewed, so I'll be interviewing him, a little different. And uh, on September 6th, we'll have uh, Anne Bickley and David Montgomery, also so two really great authors who have uh, written a bunch of books now on, on soil health and um, history as well. So I hope you will join us for those um, events. And then there's also some upcoming field days. Um, those are in person. Um, one, uh, just to what we just discussed, uh, is a post-fire mitigation field day in the Upper Mora Valley. And um, then we're also having a field day um, here south of Santa Fe. Uh, Johnson Sioux bioreactor construction uh, and filling. And, and those are both in July and you can find uh, the information about that at our website, nmhealthysoil.org. So I hope to see you all uh, sometime soon, either online or in person. Uh, until then, take good care and thank you for joining us. Thanks so much.